Have you ever felt inadequate, overwhelmed, that too much is against you and you're not up to the job? Do you ever want to walk away? That which is against you is greater than that which is for you. The maths is simple. Give up. Perhaps you've tried and tried and tried. But now you're just too weary. You're worn out and you can't keep going. Many churches are worn out and dying. Many ministers are worn out and giving up. In the past couple of years, one of my colleagues has left the ministry despite many uh, appeals and entreaties concerning his gifts and concerning his calling and there seems no real possibility of him ever returning. Another very close friend and colleague came so close to walking out on his ministry that his bags were literally packed and he was ready to go. Thank God uh, the Lord has kept him in his grace. In my experience over the years, I've been Ramsbottom now for 19 years, Most of the elders of our church have at one time or another been on the edge of giving up and really only a team ministry and the support of brethren has kept them going. And for myself, only a couple of years ago now, I came to the point where I said to my fellow pastor, I can't ever envisage preaching again. I had not committed any gross sin. I've not got anything significant to confess, and I don't have a Martin Luther complex uh, and a need to confess. I was simply worn out completely. Everything seemed stacked against me. I didn't have what it took to carry on. Today, we're going to be thinking about a man who had so much stacked against him from the start that there was surely no realistic possibility, no possibility whatsoever, of him ever accomplishing anything significant at all. A man who, when you read his background, upbringing, and difficulties in terms of personality and perspective, there were just far too many reasons why he would accomplish nothing. No possibility that he would ever be received following any kind of interview uh, for a ministerial training college or seminary or anything like that. He was a man who had everything stacked against him. And yet, as we shall see, God used him greatly. I want us to go through five things that were stacked against him. Firstly, his sins were against him. William Gadsby was born in January 1773, uh, the ninth child in a family of 14. He was born the son of a road mender in Nuneaton. But more importantly, of course, he was born in sin. David in Psalm 51 spoke truly when he confessed, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And Jeremiah said that the human heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Well, Gadsby was all of that. In his very helpful book, Ian Shaw, that's the one that I would recommend, not just because it's short, but because I think it's the fairest treatment of Gadsby. He became notorious for his swearing and profanities. In a sermon preached in London in 1841, near the end of his life, Gadsby said of his pre-conversion days, quote, When young, I gave myself up to profane swearing and hardness of heart. He described himself as a vile wretch who expected hell to open up and let me in. He's infamous for his worms, isn't he? 
not the same worms as Luther. That was a place Luther went. Uh, for Gadsby, they were worms inside him, or actually the worm that he was. And it was true. When he had completed his meager education at the age of 13, he was apprenticed as a ribbon weaver for five years. And during this time, quote, he ran to great lengths of sin and folly, swearing, lying, all manner of mischief. Already he was appearing a born leader, friendly, humorous, popular. It seems that Gadsby was a joker, uh, one that we today might call the life and soul of the party. He says of himself in a sermon of 1843, I was a mere fool and so full of frolic that I was the provider of sport for all my companions. I was the life of their society and they seemed as if they could not live without me. With his coarse jokes and profane talk, he would keep his friends regaled for as much as an hour at a time. And there are stories of him standing on upturned tubs and uh, uh, regaling and, and many roaring with laughter. And all the while, he says, quote, I used solemnly to declare that I would never think about religion. Well, Gadsby's sins were against him, were they not? Secondly, his poverty was against him. Even if we could, see, could conceive of young William finding some self-discipline and maturity at some point, dealing with uh, these grosser, coarser sins, his upbringing still stood against him. His parents were incredibly poor. I think the phrase grindingly poor is perhaps more apt. From the age of nine, William had to work to bring in money for his support. As a road mender, his father John was extremely poorly paid and could not make enough money even to put bread on the table. As a result, William's education was scanty to say the least, but more of that in our next heading. When William married Elizabeth Marvin in May 1796, we are told, obviously one does not know uh, quite how accurate these things are or, or whether there's some exaggeration, but we are told that they possessed only a chest of drawers and an umbrella of their own. Seems a bit random, actually, to be uh, purely made up, that, doesn't it? Furthermore, they had to sell the umbrella <laughs> to buy a table. What they did for a bed, mattress, chairs, or other items of furniture, we simply do not know. One of the problems is John Gadsby, his son, wrote the memoir of William, his father, and his memoir is just a rambling collection of, of, of bits and pieces. There's nothing coherent uh, about it at all. So it's very difficult to piece these things together accurately. Perhaps they had to borrow those uh, items. The weaving industry they were involved with was a cottage industry based in their homes, and the amount of profit, if we could use such a word, uh, that they made on each item was so small that if there were any mistakes or wastage, they would end up with no wages at all. One mistake in a week could put them at a loss. Hours of work were incredibly long, the dream of a mere 12-hour day was, was kind of long, long beyond the edge of the horizon. And, uh, of course, there were always great fears. Can you imagine living with the fear of illness in that context? You know, there's no sick pay, obviously. There's no uh, support whatsoever. You become sick and uh, you enter the vicious cycle. You have even less food, even less shelter. And faced with such poverty, what hope did William have of bettering himself or making any significant impact in any way? Surely he was destined to a life of frustration and conformity, grinding him down, aspirations killed, hopes of usefulness dead. William Gadsby's poverty was against him. Thirdly, his education was against him. Closely linked with his poverty was his education. As a young boy, he attended the church school in Nuneaton, uh, but only for two or three days each week. 
Here he did learn to read, we are told, but never acquired any understanding of grammar or the ability to write properly. Most certainly by today's standards, he would be termed illiterate. Since his schooling only lasted a few short years and was part-time, with his father working long hours and his mother completely occupied with providing and caring for 14 children, William must have learned virtually nothing. Even his basic reading ability was inadequate for the reading of the scriptures. And when he began to preach, he was barely able even to read a passage of the Bible without stumbling and repeating himself. In a sermon uh, preached in 1843, the year before his death, he could say of his first calling to the ministry as follows. Reference here, 164. When the Lord first put into my heart a spiritual concern about preaching the gospel, a greater fool never had existence. I had been brought up in a country place where my speech was so broad that I could only say mourn for man and corn for can. And my appearance and manners were all of a piece. As it respected literature or learning, I could not read a single chapter in the Bible. All were full of what I called hard words <laughs> from beginning to end. And what with my want of learning and want of language and my great ignorance, it appeared altogether the highest pitch of presumption for a fool like me to attempt to preach at all. And I don't think he was exaggerating, actually. With such a lack of education, what expectation of usefulness in the ministry could William Gadsby ever have? Surely his education was against him. Fourthly, his doctrinal errors were against him. And you understand all these things against him are not in the same category, but they are simply things that stood against him. William Gadsby was guilty of serious doctrinal errors, which, when considered in the cold light of day, ought to have rendered his ministry ineffective. Gadsby began preaching at the time when Andrew Fuller and William Carey were involved in what would become one of the greatest missionary movements in the history of the church. According to uh, Dr. Oliver, uh, the period in which Gadsby was ministering was a period when the Spirit was working amongst nonconformist churches. At its root... Uh, Carey and Fuller had this conviction that the preacher must declare the gospel to all people, calling them to repentance and faith in Christ Jesus as the means of their conversion. They were convinced that as the preacher offers the, the, the free gospel, that the Lord by the Spirit would empower men and women to respond. William Gadsby didn't believe that. He believed that since sinful men do not have the ability to respond to the gospel message in their fallen state, it cannot be pressed upon them as a duty so to do. He felt it was misleading to give the impression to people that they can respond in repentance and faith to the message preached. He did not see that lack of ability Ability, which we would all understand from the scriptures, does not imply lack of responsibility. Nor did he recognize that the power to respond to the call lies in the Holy Spirit's enabling, even as the call is given by the preacher. And for this reason, Gadsby distanced himself from Fuller's teachings. According to the account of his son John, which we need to interpret carefully. It's very difficult. Most of what we know about Gadsby, we know through his son John. And yet, uh, can we really rely on everything that John said about his father? Difficult. But John said uh, that his father would often repeat, quote, Andrew Fuller is the greatest enemy the church of God has ever had, as his sentiments were so much cloaked with sheep's clothing. Throughout his uh, preaching ministry, Gadsby was undoubtedly careful not to give direct exhortations to unbelievers to repent and believe the gospel. 
In addition to this error, Gadsby diminished the role of the law in the life of the new covenant believer, teaching that the gospel, not the law, was the believer's rule of conduct. And for this reason, he was often accused of antinomianism. And as if to make matters worse, Gadsby was a man of what we might call fixed opinion. He would not readily change his view upon any matter once it was made. And it seems it did not take him long to come to a view upon a matter whatsoever it might be. The account of his ordination bears this out. Having been asked to write down the account of his testimony and call before the meeting, as was the custom, so that it could be checked over by those officiating, they didn't want any shocks, he simply refused. Believing that his call could only be scrutinized by God who gave it, not by other ministers. He also believed that the laying on of hands, quote, smacked too much of Catholic ritual without, and without advancing any warning in the middle of the service, he simply steps aside as the elders see, sought to pray for him <laughs> to avoid their ministrations that were so unpleasant to his spirit. He was not interested in attending any institution of learning or joining any organization be it even an association. No, no. Gadsby was an independent of one. With such doctrinal errors against him, held with such fixedness and obstinacy, surely his ministry would be hampered and his usefulness greatly restricted both in the conversion of sinners because of that um, false view of preaching and the building up of the saints because of his uh, unbiblical view of the law. And finally, number five, the deprivation of his people was against him. Having preached his first sermon in a barn loft in Bedworth in 1798, Gansby was ordained to the ministry in Desford in 1800 at the age of 27. He preached in the villages of Bedworth, Desford and Hinckley in the Midlands, in these early years, before moving to Manchester in 1805, where he remained the minister of the Baptist Church on St. George's Road until his death 39 years later in 1844. Now, reading about the church in Manchester where he ministered, at first I thought he'd ministered in three or four different churches in Manchester, but the confusion is caused because the name of the road upon which the church was found kept changing. So initially it was back lane, then it was at St. George's Road, and later on it became Rochdale Road. So I was glad to actually read that and get that cleared up in my head. But he was at the same church in Manchester for 39 years. Now, Manchester was the first industrial town in the country, and it was horribly deprived. Let me read Ian Shaw on this. Rapid population growth left Manchester's housing stock creaking at the seams. In 1834, 17,500 people lived underground in cellar dwellings below street level prone to flooding. Dwellings were crammed together along unpaved and undrained streets. Passageways were led to cramped, stinking courtyards. Back streets were littered with piles of rotting waste and stinking pools of human sewage from the overflowing privies and earthen toilets. Windows were broken, boarded up, loose planks and rags used. A survey of 7,000 houses two years previously found a nearly 1,000 premises in a state of ill repair and a third of them without any kind of privy. 352 streets were filled with heaps of refuse, stagnant pools and ordure, whatever ordure is, Overcrowding was chronic. Life expectancy in 1843 was just 24 years, with 57% of children dying before they were five. The streets around the Baptist Chapel in Manchester were in a particularly bad state. Allied to this was the poverty of the area of Manchester in which St. George's Road Chapel was located. Gansby Riley observed that the nearby Angel Street should have been renamed Black Angel Street because of its filthy state. Asa Briggs describes Manchester at this time as abominably filthy. The steam engine is pestiferous. 
the dye houses noisome and offensive, and the water of the river black as ink. Malnutrition, cholera, and rickets, particularly amongst the children because of the lack of sunlight that uh, they were exposed to, claimed the lives of many. The Corn Laws were scandalous and caused terrible poverty, deprivation, and malnutrition to the working people. Basically, uh, the Corn Laws had been introduced by the government in order to protect uh, Britain's uh, agricultural industry. It meant that, that prices had to be fixed at a certain level, that duties had to be paid on any imports, and all of this meant that that um, basic food was just too expensive for the working poor. Uh, the idea that there would be a minimum wage or a national living wage was, as we've said, pie in the sky, beyond the 15 millionth horizon. It was just not even considered. And uh, these poor people suffered horrendously. Crime was rife. There were riots and disturbances. Alcoholism and prostitution abounded. And all of this affected Gadsby's congregation, the vast majority of whom were ordinary working people. What hope was there of Gadsby making any significant impact ministering in such poverty-stricken context to uneducated and needy people? This was certainly no mission to the socially significant people of his day. Now just pause at that point and consider the sheer weight of all that was against William Gadsby. His particular sins, his upbringing, his education, his doctrinal errors held with such fixed conviction and the poverty and deprivation of his own people. Can any of us produce a list quite so overwhelming as that? Even if we can, I'm sure we wouldn't be able to produce a list more overwhelming than that of what is against us. And so let Gadsby's testimony be a great encouragement to us all today. For his life was remarkably blessed of God and produced extraordinary fruit for the glory of Christ Jesus. Were his sins against him? Ah, but he was a sinner saved by grace. A great sinner saved by a greater grace. At the age of 17, in the condition we've already described in ungodliness and sinfulness, he witnessed the hanging of three men in Coventry. Often public hangings were, were contexts of entertainment, and he thought he would go along for the entertainment, but this hanging was particularly gruesome. I don't want to make the uh, breakfast in your stomach churn too much, so I won't give you too much detail. But suffice to say that one of the three men was so light and emaciated that the executioners had to take measures in order to cause his neck to break as he was being hanged. And the vision of those three men, particularly that one emaciated man hanging, propelled eternity right before the eyes of this young man. He could not get out of his mind what it meant to stand before God in judgment. He felt the conviction and the terror of his sin. Let me read to you uh, from one of his own sermons. When the Lord was graciously pleased to quicken my soul, being then just turned 17, and to show me something of what sin was, I really feared it. 
And a turn in my mind took place of a very different kind. I was brought to feel now that my sins were against a holy, just and good God. That I had not merely to be alarmed for the consequences and punishment due to sin. But I had to stand before the bar of the infinite purity. And give an account of my awful practices. Which made my soul solemnly to tremble at the word of God. And before the glory of his majesty. It is one thing to be alarmed at sin through the fear of going to hell and quite another sensibly to feel it as against a holy, just and good God and that the soul is accountable to him for it. And while I remained in this state, all the efforts I used to execrate myself only seemed to make my case worse for every step I took appeared as though the Lord had designed to open a fresh wound in my conscience and only to let me experience more deeply the abominable and loathsome disease of sin. And oh, what a low estate is this for a poor sinner to be in without a single ray of satisfactory hope of ever receiving the blessings of salvation. Isn't it extraordinary? For a man to say, the fear of hell is nothing besides the fear of standing before a holy God. He had a right view of sin. And having come under such genuine conviction, according to his own theology of effectual calling, he did not have the power to respond to the gospel until granted what he calls little faith. Enabling to embrace the grace of Christ. But whatever meanderings he went down, he ended up in exactly the right place at the last. Uh, let me read to you again from Gadsby's sermon. Few perhaps have felt a more heart rending in the workings of the natural conscience than I have. I was in that terrible state for years. And when alone, I expected hell to open up and let me in. And I thought the devil was ready to drag me into hell. I very believe that this was all nature, by which he means a natural conviction rather than a spiritual conviction, you see. But when God the Spirit came and manifested sin in my conscience and opened a little of the mystery of iniquity, I then found that all in my nature and practice had been nothing less than one constant heaving up of rebellion against a holy, just and good God. And there I was with all my sin and guilt torturing my mind, feeling myself as an accountable being to a holy God whose mercy I had abused, whose goodness I had despised. If the blessed spirit had not loved me with a peculiar love, yes, he was a particular Baptist, he would never have taken so much pains with hard-hearted and vile use youth as I. No, he would have said, let him alone. Let him seal his own damnation and reap the wages due to his sin. But, oh, the mercy, the special mercy and love of our covenant God. When the set time came, he arrested me, broke my heart and brought me to stand and bow before his throne as a guilty criminal, brought me to sign my own death warrant. I felt that God had a right to damn me, I had nothing to offer and I could do nothing to save myself. I felt that God would be perfectly just in cutting me off and sending me to hell. But oh, God's peculiar love that was shed abroad in my heart by his blessed spirit, which brought me to feel the love and blood of Christ, led to trace something of the wondrous work of his wonder-working grace. Then how my hard heart was melted. I was brought to his footstool with all humility, simplicity and godly sincerity, filled with gratitude and love for God's unspeakable mercies in opening these great mysteries to my poor soul. I was then solemnly and blessedly led to believe in God's free mercy and pardon and could look up and say, he loved me and gave himself for me. All oh, these little words, this me, this ye, this I, may we all know the preciousness of them. And may the Lord, the Spirit, bring our hearts to enjoy the blessings they convey. We shall then know something of those glorious blessings of God's pardoning mercy and love, which cannot be described and which belong to his peculiar people. That, of course, being his text, his peculiar people. 
when a man knows himself to be a debtor to sovereign grace. And yes, we are allowed to use that phrase. A debtor to sovereign grace. When he knows that the only hope for sinners lies in the mercy of God revealed in Christ Jesus. When he understands his own wretchedness. Yes, he did think he was nothing more than a worm. How will such a man serve and witness and preach? Upon whom will he depend? What will be his message? And when he has preached to thousands, to whom will he give all the glory? The conviction of his sinfulness was not against him in his life of service, but very much in his favor. No wonder his dying words were, free grace, free grace, free grace. Do you know, you think about that and you think, it's a bit odd, isn't it? You know, you're about to die and you shout out (laughs) these phrases. It's so bizarre that one imagines it must be true. Saved by grace, free grace. Are we sometimes less effective in our evangelism? Because we do not recognize the inability of man to respond to the gospel unaided. Gadsby was right about that. And the absolute necessity of the fullness of God's grace in the salvation of sinners. Is our own lack of conviction of sin today a real weakness? is the wording and the phraseology found in so many of Gadsby's hymns and Joseph Hart's hymns and all the other hymns found in, in Gadsby's hymnal. Is that a sign of the fact really we don't believe the same truth of how sinful we are and how sinful the people are to whom we preach? Have we misunderstood sin as being simply something evil, or something wicked, or something bad, or something mistaken, rather than a cosmic crime against a holy, pure, infinite God? This was Gatsby's view. And he preached then in a manner that produced conviction of sin. We are so obsessed today with our methods So obsessed with our approach and and the way that we will go about it. And jumping on the latest bandwagon, whether it's a three-point or a seven-point plan for revitalization or whatever it is. We've lost our confidence in preaching. Gadsby didn't. He knew the size, the depth of the grace needed to save sinners. And he preached with that in view. I wonder if you still sing this. Um, We have two hymn books in our church. And sadly, this one isn't included in either of them. So we produced another hymn book and we put this in. Our supplement has more old hymns in it than new ones. Here it is. Pause my soul and ask the question, art thou ready to meet God? Am I made a real Christian washed in the Redeemer's blood? Have I union to the church's living head? Am I quickened by his spirit? Live a life of faith and prayer, trusting wholly to his merit, casting on him all my care, daily panting in his likeness to appear. If my hope on Christ is stayed, let him come when he thinks best. O oh, my soul, be not dismayed. Lean upon his loving breast. He will cheer thee with the smilings of his face. But if still a total stranger to his precious name and blood, thou art on the brink of danger. Canst thou face a holy God? Think and tremble. Death is now upon the road. Is that a bit strong for you? It wasn't for Gadsby. Sinner saved by grace. Secondly, a deprived man who found great riches in Christ Jesus. Was the deprivation of Gadsby's upbringing really against him? Gadsby's own poverty made him rejoice all the more in the riches that were his in Christ Jesus. Because he had so little of this world's stuff, for want of a better phrase, even good and legitimate things in themselves, 
He was continually preoccupied with the riches that could only be found in Christ Jesus. It comes out again and again in his hymns. Uh, number 667. Immortal honors rest on Jesus' head. My God, my portion and my living bread. In him I live, upon him cast my care. He saves from death, destruction and despair. He is my refuge in each deep distress. The Lord, my strength and glorious righteousness. Through floods and flames he leads me safely on and daily makes his sovereign goodness known. My every need he richly will supply. Nor will his mercy ever let me die. In him there dwells a treasure all divine and matchless grace has made that treasure mine. Oh, that my soul could love and praise him more. His beauty's trace, his majesty adore. Live near his heart, upon his bosom lean. Obey his voice and all his will esteem. Gadsby loved Christ. Gadsby's riches were in Christ. Christ was his joy. Christ was his treasure. Christ was his hope. Christ was all his glory. He had none of his own. When Gadsby first preached at the church in Manchester, it was this great appreciation of the glory of all that was in Christ Jesus that made him so energetic in the preaching and in the cause of the gospel. Um, this is a quotation uh, from the memoir, John Gadsby. Besides preaching four times a week to his own people at Manchester, he for years preached four or five other sermons during the week and every week elsewhere. After preaching at home three times on the Lord's Day, he would walk on the Monday morning to Rochdale, 11 miles from Manchester, to dinner. After dinner, he would walk two or three miles further to preach in the afternoon, then return to Rochdale and preach in the evening. See, he's a northerner. Dinner is at lunchtime, you see. <laughs> on the Tuesday, he would walk to Manchester and preach to his own people at night. On the Wednesday, he would walk to Oldham, Bury just round the corner from us, Stockport, some of you from there, Pendlebury and other places, preach at night. And on the Thursday, start off to another town and preach and return home on the Friday. Another week, he would procure a supply of, for his own place on Tuesday and take a tour almost on foot to Blackburn, Preston, Accrington, Rossendale. A third week, he would go into Yorkshire. Yes, he did cross the border. Halifax, Bradford, Huddersfield. And in a fourth week, Derbyshire, Cheshire, etc., a man of incredible energy. Why? Because he had found these riches and he wanted everyone to share them. And he, he was never any danger of being distracted by the affairs of his age because he didn't have any. This love for Christ, commitment to the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. It was always the preaching of the gospel. Now, I'm not saying anything against Bible studies and small groups and DVD schemes and, and study books. I mean, I've been promoting one. There's a great place for all of these things. But preaching, isn't that the great means that God has appointed? And Gatsby believed this. And honestly, the only thing he could do was preach. There are countless accounts of him standing up to read the scriptures. And people who've come to hear him first time, having heard his reputation... They're ready to walk out because he, can't, he still can't read the Bible properly. But when he preaches, suddenly the people are gripped. The power of God descends and people are saved. So Gadsby had a massive impact across the whole region. Under his energetic and spirit-empowered ministry, new members were added to the church in Manchester through baptism almost every week. And the congregation grew from a perhaps around 100 in 1807. Initially, when he, he went there in 1805, numbers fell away because of the Fullerite controversy to about 100. But by the end of his ministry, there were over 1,000 in the church. And the church became the largest dissenting cause in Manchester 
Regionally, a number of churches were established through Gadsby's ministry. The claim that he planted over 40 churches, that's a claim made by John, is almost certainly exaggerated. But Ian Shaw helpfully outlines three ways in which Gadsby's influence led to the establishment of different new churches across the region. Firstly, uh, churches were established across the region when hearers came to hear Gadsby preach at George's Road Chapel, traveling from a distance. And rather than having them constantly traveling the distance, he would encourage them to establish a work uh, in their own locality. So George Greenhuff and William Withington uh, were sent as supply preachers to a church established in Middleton in 1819 through this means. A second way in which new chapels were founded came through Gadsby's encouragement of groups and believers in towns or villages where no Baptist chapel existed. So Gadsby was taking the initiative in this instance. In this way, the cause at Charlesworth in Derbyshire was established, a cause uh, dear to the heart of a number of us. George Meller and Squire Booth had been traveling to Stockport to hear gospel preaching, began holding meetings in Booth's house, and later they hired a loom shop. On the 2nd of October, 1816, Gadsby preached for them in a barn. The next day, he baptized four candidates and formed them into a church. The work developed slowly, but in 1835, a building was commenced. Recently, it's been renovated with the help of uh, uh, some folks here. Um, So the building was put up. And uh, Gadsby preached at the opening in 1837. Such a crowd gathered that Gadsby had to preach from a platform on a window ledge. And they took the window out in order to be heard by those inside and outside the building. And in fact, when Rochdale Road Cemetery was um, built on uh, sometime later, which is where Gadsby initially was buried, his uh, remains and the tomb was moved to Charlesworth Chapel. And you can see his tombstone there to this day. A third way in which causes were formed was by Gadsby preaching in towns where the gospel was preached in more dilute form. And uh, uh, for example, the congregation in Rochdale where John Warburton became the pastor was established in such a way. So Gadsby was a man of incredible energy. But don't put that down to his personality. Put it down to his love for Christ. Because he had such riches. He simply had to get out there. I'd had a pang of self-pity this morning. I've had to work hard on, on, on this uh, uh, message over some time. It's been difficult. I was feeling a little bit sorry for myself this morning, a bit tired, late night last night. And then I suddenly thought of Gadsby. I just said, don't be pathetic. <laughs> get on with it. Self-pity. No, he didn't go in for that. You see, it was this man's deprivation in his upbringing that de- deprivation in his upbringing that caused the glory of Christ to appear to him so marvelous. How can Christ manifest such grace and love and mercy to me? And we read that, didn't we, in his sermon when he talks about his conversion? To me, to me, to me. How then could he do anything else in his life but tell others this wonderful message? Thirdly, he was an uneducated man, but his preaching brought Christ to the people. So we've seen about his grasp of the wonder of grace. We've seen about his rejoicing in the, in the riches that are in Christ. But now consider as an uneducated man, he brought Christ to the people. Gadsby's lack of education, yes, it was a stumbling block to many when he first met them or they heard about him. Uh, There's an account, uh, Robert Oliver gives this in his article in Reformation Today, number eight, uh, of one man, John Warburton. When he got to the chapel, he thought to him, I thought to myself, what a poor, gloomy, miserable place this is. More than just a table in the wrong place, uh, Gary, there. And the people, as the people came in, 
I felt such a hatred rise up in my heart against them as I have never felt against any people before. Hold your horses. Nay, so much so that I was just ready to take up my hat and walk out when Mr. Gadsby got into his pulpit. I was struck with surprise to see so poor and mean-looking a fellow, as I thought him, attempt to preach. I despised him in my very soul and thought he looked like an ignorant fool that had no common sense. The words of his text were, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man, so on. And he was so long in reading the passage that I dropped my head down and thought I would try to sleep. (laughs) Then he made a little pause, and I looked up to see what he was about, and he was looking around the chapel and rolling his eyes in such a way that I thought him really crazy. The The first words that he spoke were, perhaps you will be ready to say that according to our sentiments, we cannot find a good man on earth. But by the help of God, we will or we will ransack the Bible from Genesis to Revelation to find him. Oh, how my prejudice was knocked down at a blow. And you think, well, hold on, those are not particularly great words. Why were you knocked down like a blow with that? He says, my soul melted like wax before the sun. And I exclaimed, God bless thee. The Lord help thee to find that good man. You see, the Holy Spirit was upon his preaching. And when people heard Gadsby preach, they gave all the glory to God. There was nothing about him to glorify. The accounts of his early days are that he wore the wrong kind of clothes and they were particularly ragged and dirty. He stood in the wrong kind of way. He looked out at the people with the wrong kind of perspective and he read the passage in a completely hopeless manner. And then he preached, and God spoke to the people. 514 in his hymnal. Oh, what matchless condescension. The eternal God displays, claiming our supreme attention to his boundless works and ways. His own glory he reveals in gospel days. In the person of the Savior, all his majesty is seen. Love and justice shine forever and without a veil between. Worms approach him. And rejoice in his dear name. I think some of our hymnals have changed the words there a little. Would we view his brightest glory? Here it shines in Jesus' face. Sing and tell the pleasing story. O ye sinners saved by grace and with pleasure bid the guilty him embrace. In his highest work, redemption, see his glory in a blaze. Nor can angels ever mention aught that more of God displays. Grace and justice here unite to endless days. True, tis sweet and solemn pleasure. God to view in Christ the Lord. Here he smiles and smiles forever. May my soul his name record. Praise and bless him. Why are we so man-centered in our churches? Why do we not gather on our Lord's day? Full of anticipation to worship and glorify Jesus the Christ. Our minds are so often fixed upon ourselves, our feelings, our issues, our fears, our needs, our hang-ups. The crisis of identity in our society is affecting our churches. We have this self-esteem issue. And Gatsby blows all that away. Just look to Jesus. Can't you see we're nothing? If you doubt it, just look at me. Gadsby's preaching was so relevant, so personal, so Christ-centered and so powerful that there are countless stories, and we're already running out of time, of remarkable conversions. One such was a poor woman who was so overwhelmed with the misery of her condition that she had been planning to drown herself in the river next to Gadsby's chapel. For a moment she thought twice of it, walked inside the chapel. And, quote, was brought to the blessings of salvation. In his life and ministry, his lack of education was not actually 
against him, but in God's providence caused him all the more to magnify Christ Jesus. In fact, it made him uniquely accessible to the working man. Robert Halley, principal of New College London, uh, and so a very well-educated man, spoke of Gadsby as follows. He seemed a preacher made on purpose for the working classes. His popularity with the factory people of Manchester was extraordinary since he was not a Lancashire man. Nor was he a Yorkshire man, John, sorry. (laughs) Number four, our time is running short, so we'll have to be brief. He was a man in error that God still used for the conversion and sanctification of many. Yes, he denied the free offer of the gospel or the rightness of any personal appeal to the individual sinner to repent and believe because he was afraid that the individual might seek to do it in his own natural strength. That's why he didn't do it. And yet his hymns and his preaching are full of invitation to needy sinners to come to the warm embrace of the Savior. I thought about reading you a few passages from his sermons which show the kind of, if you're looking at them doctrinally rather than listening to the preaching, you can see the meandering path he goes down to avoid using certain words. But the end result is he's appealing to sinners to come and be saved. I was going to read to you about the conversion of James Chambers, but our time has gone. Perhaps better just to read to you one of his hymns. I don't think it appears in any of the uh, hymnals published today. 587. This is, this is Gadsby quotes. I'm putting it in quotes. I don't want to upset anybody. Gadsby, the so-called hyper-Calvinist. Listen. Come whosoever will, nor vainly strive to mend. Sinners are freely welcomed still to Christ, the sinner's friend. The gospel tables spread and richly furnished too, with wine and milk and living bread and dainties not a few. The guilty, vile and base, the wretched and forlorn are welcomed to the feast of grace, though goodness they have none. No goodness he expects. He came to save the poor, poor, helpless souls. He ne'er neglects nor sends them from his door. His tender, loving heart, the vilest, will embrace and freely to them will impart the riches of his grace. And there are many hymns like that. And concerning the godliness and sanctification of his members, despite the accusations of antinomianism because of his view of the law, Gansby was universally recognized as a man of remarkable integrity himself, and he fostered that same godliness in his people. The story of told, is told of Gadsby being accused, as so often was the case, of being antinomian. And maybe, purely, if you look at his doctrine and his statements, he was an antinomian in that strict sense. But having been thus accused, he asked the accuser, can you point to ungodliness in my life? The man said, no. Is my congregation marked by lawlessness and ungodliness? The man said, no. On the contrary, it is known throughout the region as a godly congregation. Gadsby then, because he kept his sense of humor, asked the man, well, is my evil doctrine causing you to sin? The man stumbled a little and said, well, no, because I don't believe it. So he said, you tell me what harm I'm doing then. How many people were saved through Gadsby's ministry? How many were transformed? We cannot tell. It must run to the multiple thousands. As with Paul, as he speaks of the Thessalonians, surely there is a crown of glory awaiting this man. No rags in heaven for him. And finally, he was a man of Christ-like compassion for the deprived. As we have seen, the last thing that was against Gasby was the extreme poverty of his congregation, and indeed the whole town in which he ministered. Yet this was no hindrance at all, but rather a wonderful backdrop, a wonderful context in which the remarkable and Christ-like compassion of this man was put on display. Gadsby was constantly moved by the terrible poverty that confronted him every day in Manchester. He would regularly part with sums of money he could ill afford to be without in order to alleviate the sufferings of those around him. Gadsby's compassion, says Ian Shaw, was immensely practical. He sheltered the family of unemployed James Humes in his own home in 1832. 
The first Sunday of 1840 was set aside as a special day for collections for the poor. And Gadsby's text that day was the faithful God, Deuteronomy 7, 9. However, the poverty of many members made this increasingly difficult. In 1839, because of the economic downturn, there were 90 on the chapel's regular poor list, to 50 of whom flannel and blankets had been distributed. Gadsby was generous to those in need, whatever their religious background, Catholic, Protestant, Jew, Christian, Arminian, Calvinist. One poor Irish woman greeted the news of Gadsby's death, saying, bless his soul, I hope he's at rest. Once he kept me from starving when my own priest would not give me a farthing. He also became politically active in an attempt to change the laws of the day so that the plight of the poor could be alleviated. He was no radical in his politics, yet he, and he never supported any insubordination or law-breaking, but he spoke out repeatedly and earnestly on behalf of the people whose suffering was so palpable and intense. In the summer of 1819, 11 people were killed and Hundreds injured in Manchester when a crowd of protesters in St. Peter's Field was charged by guardsmen on horseback who panicked. They were only objecting to working conditions and political oppression, which, as we've seen, was all too real. Although Gadsby was not involved in the protest, he supported their cause and signed a petition affirming his opposition to the actions of the officials. He went further. He supported the anti-corn law movement and spoke out repeatedly against the laws both in public and in his preaching, whatever we might think of that. He argued his case from the scriptures. The corn laws, he declared, quote, were directly opposed to the word of God. He said, God's corn law is Genesis 1.29. Behold, I have given you, humanity, every green herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To, it, it, to you it shall be for meat. And he said that the current laws in Britain violated the law of God. He used to lead meetings and the, and the political leaders and the and, and, and others would be on the platform. Gadsby would speak first, and then they would stand up and say, well, after Mr. Gadsby has spoken, what more can be added? And really nothing more could be added. <laughs> the actions of wealthy landlords, Gadsby believed, says he in Shaw, were denying the right of the laboring poor to the vital resource of bread. The anti-corn law movement was strongly supported from the Rochdale Road Church, not different church, just change of name of road, and in the Sunday school which Gadsby established. Because it impacted upon the poor so greatly, it was a religious as well as a political issue. Gadsby freely used biblical evidence in public meetings to make his point. In April 1841, he based his message on Psalm 104. He causeth the grass to grow for the cattle and herb for the service of man that he may bring forth food out of the earth. He denounced government leaders for persisting with corn laws, which were leading to the starvation of the people. You might have thought, you know, since Gasby was preaching to such a poor congregation, he might show some deference when a rich guy stumbled in. No. <laughs> he just fired his arrows straight at him. You're part of the problem. Get yourself sorted out, was basically his message. These are just a couple of many examples of Gadsby's labors amongst the poor. And again, time does not permit for us to list more. Of course, nothing could turn him aside from his greatest priority, the preaching the gospel of free grace in Christ Jesus, which alone could really meet the needs of the poorest. When William Gadsby broke his leg in September 1840, uh, the Manchester Times recorded this. Isn't this extraordinary? This is the Manchester Times recording that the uh, local strict Baptist pastor has broken his leg. <laughs> Accident to the Reverend W. Gadsby. We regret to state that last week, while Mr. Gadsby was walking in his garden, he fell and broke the larger bone of his right leg just above the ankle. Any cessation of the activity of such a man is a public calamity. His preaching although marked by some eccentricities, is of a high order, combining all the fervor of a deep devotion with the exercise of vigorous and acute and original intellect. 
And <laughs> newspapers spout nonsense, don't they? <laughs> and his active practical benevolence, now we're getting to it, manifesting itself not only of the relief of the distressed around him, but by his ardent desire to promote good legislation and thus to advance the happiness of the whole human family, have endeared him alike to the sincere Christian, the philanthropist, and the political reformer of abuses. And so when it came to Gadsby's funeral, the lines, uh, the streets of Manchester were lined. It was a traditional Lancashire February day. Don't seem to have those anymore, but there was snow on the ground. Thousands gathered, six morning coaches and 30 other coaches followed. That's 36 coaches in the funeral possession for this guy. Extraordinary, isn't it? John Kershaw, uh, one of Gadsby's protégés, who was the pastor of the church in Rochdale, uh, preached. I don't have time to quote from his sermon, but one thing he said this. As I write, I have in the eye of my mind the open vault with more than 3,000 persons surrounding it on a snowy morning. I cannot forget the feelings of my mind as I stood at the head of the grave and saw his body descending into it. The thought that I should see his face no more in the flesh, no more hear his voice exalting a precious Christ in the salvation of his chosen people to the joy of my heart, that I should no more have him to tell my troubles unto and to advise with in the affairs of Zion greatly distressed me. When I began to address the vast assembly, many of whom were in tears, I felt that the power of the Spirit of God was upon me and the words spoken, applying it to the souls of the people from the solemn attention that was paid and the grief manifested at the loss of so great a man which had that day fallen in Israel. Gadsby's tombstone uh, reads as follows. He arrests the body of a sinner base who had no hope but in electing grace. The love, blood, life and righteousness of God was his sweet theme. And this he spread abroad. Our time has gone, but I'm going to steal five minutes from your coffee time. Sorry about that. Because just a couple of things by way of lesson to conclude. Firstly, be careful what you do with the legacy of your heroes. Be careful what you do with the legacy of your heroes. I was brought up to believe, personal testimony, that creeds and confessions were quotes of the devil that the entire church in the country was apostate and that Baptists were frankly beyond the pale. When I was uh, baptized at the age of 20 at university, none of my entire Christian family attended and I was treated as a pariah. Now, how could that happen in a family where the Bible was read every day, we were nonconformists and the gospel was believed and preached? Answer, because one member of my family wasn't careful with the legacy of his hero. His hero was Lloyd-Jones. And uh, Lloyd-Jones became our apostle through book and tape. We didn't go to church. We listened to Lloyd-Jones. We didn't hear God's word being preached with authority from a pulpit. We listened to Lloyd-Jones because, well, nobody else has got anything to say, have they? And so Lloyd-Jones' legacy was distorted and twisted. And uh, we suffered badly as a result of that. Thankfully, I saw the light, and now I'm a Baptist, so we're all okay. But... <laughs> Would Lloyd-Jones have approved of this approach, a, a gathering around a tape recording machine on a Sunday morning instead of attending the local church? But it was based on his legacy. Many churches in the second half of the 19th century, the first half of the 20th century, embraced a barren hyper-Calvinism that stunted growth and killed evangelism. And they took William Gadsby as their father in the faith. They sang his hymns and used his catechism and honored his memory, but they failed to follow his example. Yes, as we have seen, Gadsby was in error, arguing against the duty of repentance and faith and the free offer of the gospel, if we can use these for this phrase, in theory. But in practice, he preached with zeal and earnest concern unto the conversion of thousands. We might say it was John Gadsby's fault. I'll leave that to you to determine. Very possibly so. But whether it was John Gadsby or others, 
do be careful what you do with the legacy of your heroes. William's son John was the conduit through which his father's legacy was passed on. Wow. Secondly, very briefly, compassion covers a multitude of faults. Now, don't take me out of context. I'm not saying as long as you've got love, it doesn't matter what you believe. That's not the message. But look at Gadsby's life. And you have to say the one thing that radiates is his compassion. His compassion for poor, lost sinners was palpable. His appeals and entreaties and loving concern in his sermons. He could not do enough for those who were oppressed and in need. And all his faults, all that stubbornness, all that obstinacy, all that fixed opinionedness, all that was used of the Lord in the remarkable ministry of this incredibly Christ-like man who looked out on the people as sheep lacking a shepherd and went down amongst them and shepherded them. Can I ask why is such compassion lacking today? Is it because compassion requires selflessness and we are self-obsessed? Compassion moves to action and we are frankly lazy. Compassion drains our emotional tank and we are already empty. Compassion demands time and we are just too busy. Compassion is supremely Christ-like. And we are far too ungodly. May the spirit of William Gadsby live in our hearts. And may God receive all the glory. Amen. Amen.